Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to welcome you here. Um, the second last day of the Biennale. And I think that uh, we are very sad that tomorrow it finishes. But we are very happy that we have uh, such a collection of people uh, on the rostrum here with us this, this afternoon. I just want to begin by reading uh, the words of the focus for this afternoon in our manifesto, Free Space. And what we say is, we are interested in going beyond the visual, emphasizing the role of architecture in the choreography of life, but essentially we see the earth as client. This brings with it long-lasting responsibilities. Architecture is the play of light, sun, shade, moon, air, wind, gravity, in ways that reveal the mysteries of the world. All these resources are free. It's the examples of generosity and thoughtfulness in architecture throughout the world that we wanted and want to celebrate in this 16th International Architecture Exhibition. Uh, I'd just like to introduce our speakers and I'm going to introduce them in the order of speaking and just say a little bit about why they're here. And starting with uh, Mary Robinson, um, the lady in red, uh, <laughs> in the middle, um, who was president of Ireland from 1990 to 1997. And she was no ordinary president. She was an inspirational president of our country for those years and has gone on to do amazing things in the UN High Commissioner uh, for Human Rights from 1997 to 2002, and now she is Chair of the Elders. Uh, she's involved in the whole um, issue of climate change at a global level. Yvonne and I heard Mary on national radio one morning, and we were both really moved by the way uh, she spoke about climate change and the, uh, the need for us to take this on board. And we were walking along one of our streets, Nassau Street, uh, to meet the Arts Council actually, and we saw Mary on the street and we just walked up and she didn't know us and we said, please, would you come and speak at this Biennale? And she's here. And that was a very abrupt uh, but interesting uh, introduction. Uh, then we uh, have and you were holding a banana. <laughs> I didn't want to say that. Um, and actually, a friend of Mary's calls it the banana meeting. Um, so then we have Barry Bergdahl, the handsome man with the glasses on the left of the lady in red. And Barry has, um, I have to say that each of these people have influenced us in very different ways at different times of our lives. Um, Barry Bergdahl as um, Professor of Art History at Columbia, Columbia University um, and also Curator in the Department of Architecture and Design at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. He's resp been responsible for numerous uh, exhibitions and publications on architecture, many of them which are beside our desk, in particular one where you were involved with the uh, La Brust exhibition, partly because we're doing a library, but because the work that, that he does as a, as a writer and as a, a researcher and as a curator is what feeds us in our practice. Uh, then we have um, Chin Chan, uh, Zhu, beside me on the left. And we met, we met Chin Chen today uh, for the first time. We met by Skype and we met her through her work. And actually one of the most interesting things in the Biennale is discovering strangers. Strangers that we have no personal relationship with, but uh, in our research in, in relation to uh, the, the working on the Biennale that we found work which, we, which arrested us and stopped us in our paths and said this work is really interesting. And I think uh, Chen Chan will be um, presenting some of the projects and will describe today the way that she works in China, the way that she invents projects, the way she works with communities. And you, I think, speak about the connection between 
the, the micro and the macro between the community and infrastructure. And so the, the, what Yvonne is talking about in terms of the earth as client, we're thinking about issues of climate and, and infrastructure and the experience we had all this morning in Venice of the the, the, the flooding and, and that which is happening throughout the world. But it's also how architects operate at the micro scale. What can we do as practitioners and what can we do that is uh, effective and I suppose promotes the role of architecture. And then we have Raphael Maneo and there's many, there are many Irish architects in this audience and I know that the work of Raphael Maneo has uh, influenced so many of us in terms of the way that he has made such beautiful work, both new buildings and insertions into uh, existing important sites. I suppose one of the early projects we all were inspired by was the Merida project. And he goes on to influence generations of, of architects through his teaching and through his uh, work. And we're delighted that he's here. And I, I have to say, Yvonne and I visited um, the Biennale separately uh, after the vernissage when it was very difficult to um, to absorb everything and again we both we both separately wrote in our notebooks um, a piece of the text that Raphael wrote to describe his interpretation of free space and I'll just read one line the perception of free space appears at the moment when a building's condition as an artifact gives way and space is felt as a sensorial expression of freedom. And we just felt that was a marvelously poetic um, interpretation of uh, free space. And then we have Simone Rotz from uh, Crimson Architectural Historians uh, and the presentation that Crimson have made in the Central Pavilion is one that uh, really challenges not just us as practicing architects, but also challenged our Taoiseach, our Prime Minister, when he came to, um, to Venice to visit the Biennale. And it was one of the exhibits which he photographed where you're making the case that uh, cities should be places of welcome. I think you say something like that the city is the tool of emancipation and that the city has lost this uh, this capacity or this quality and you're asking the question of architects and planners and thinkers as to how do we make remake or rebuild the idea of um, cities as places of welcome. So we're delighted to have this combination of people here with us to discuss from very different viewpoints uh, the overall or the, the general kind of theme uh, of the uh, Earth is Client. Thank you. So, Mary. Buenasera, and thank you for the real joy and pleasure of being here. I had been looking forward to it, but it's even better than I had thought about. And I just want to begin by congratulating Paolo Baratta and the Biennale for choosing such excellent curators for this Biennale, uh, who stopped me in the street. <laughs> And I, I want to share something that was said to me uh, quite accidentally in the sense it wasn't a conversation about anything to do with a Biennale, um, but it was by, um, uh, just literally three days ago, I was talking to Peter Gabriel, who will be no known to at least um, quite a number of you probably here, and he said to me, you know Mary, the, art of, the, the act of curation is as important as the act of creation. And he didn't know that I would be coming here, didn't know anything about the Biennale, but it, it stayed in my head. He was actually talking about the elders that I now have some responsibility as chair of the elders that were brought together by Nelson Mandela to curate and nourish the values of our uh, world. The, um, we're in the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, etc. And uh, I was going to make a completely different speech for my five minutes, and I'll try and be good and give a good lead on this panel. But actually, being here, walking in the Wellingtons this morning, plastic Wellingtons, to get through the, uh, the water that had um, welled over, uh, obviously was a lesson in itself about climate change. But I've been struggling uh, to find the narrative we need 
for our world now that we're in a very acute situation. We've just had a report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was a report they were asked to do by the Paris Climate Summit. And the reason they were asked to do it was small island states and least developed countries in the months before Paris, in December 2015, kept putting on pressure and pleading. And they marched with the line 1.5 to stay alive, 1.5 to stay alive. Because they knew that small islands would go underwater and that least developed countries all over the world would be even more disrupted and buffeted and set back by intense drought, intense flooding, hurricanes, etc. And so, the Paris Agreement agreed that the standard for our world was, was that we would be well below two degrees and working for 1.5 degrees. And I thought, and I was the special envoy of the Secretary General at that time leading up to and just after Paris, and I think everybody thought that was for small island states. Now we know differently. That's not for small island states, that's for the whole world. And what the recent report says is that to have a livable world at all, which will be a little bit more difficult than the world we have at the moment in the intensity of hurricanes and storms and drought and flooding and forest fires, etc. It'll be worse because we'll have put up more emissions, but it will be livable. After that, between 1.5 and 2 degrees, things happen that are very serious. The coral reefs go, the Arctic ice goes, the permafrost begins to melt, and then we are in loopback territory, and the scientists don't know how to describe that. Now, that's something that could frighten and depress and put all the energy out of the room. What we need is the cultural world to help us to invent the narrative of the world we must work for. We have 12 years to reduce by 45% our greenhouse gas emissions. The whole world, reduce by 45% and then to go to zero emissions by 2050. That's what that means, to have a safe world for our children and grandchildren who are already alive, never mind the future generations. And so I've been thinking a lot about how to, how to, how to propose that narrative. We know that clean energy is getting cheaper, solar is getting cheaper, wind is getting cheaper, China is leading on wind, on solar, on electric vehicles, um, it's all, battery retention is getting better, but we're not hearing the narrative about how we will live. And I saw this morning, as I walked through, the narrative of so many projects um, from around the world of how we could live better, how architects are telling us, and it's architects and artists and filmmakers, the cultural world which must now step up and help us to imagine the world we need to get to very fast and we need to do it fairly. And let me just end with something that I've been very aware of. I was in London two days ago and the bridges were being blocked by young climate scientists, young and not so young climate activists who are so desperate that we're not moving ahead fast enough. They're blocking bridges to disrupt London, to get London to wake up and do more in Paris. The, uh, what do they call them, the gilets jaunes, the, the yellow vests are marching through Paris because a carbon tax has been put on fuel, a fuel tax, and they're, they're annoyed about it. I don't think it's just the fuel tax they're annoyed about, it's the unfairness of how it's being done and the inequality of the society that's doing it. It's, it's, it that's what's the problem. So we need a just transition. And I just appeal to the Biennale in particular because you have such depth and wealth of culture, but also to the architects um, of free space. I could have talked about free space, and I was going to, but actually I saw examples of the world I want us to hear more about, and I looked to the cultural world to help us to get there, because it's so important, and we have so little time, and it's so urgent. Thank you. So it's a, it's a huge pleasure to be here. It's very daunting to follow on Mary Robinson. I wish the world had more leaders, uh, not only who can speak so cogently about what is at stake, but also understand that the cultural imaginary is a huge part of it. 
Uh, and so uh, I feel a bit like Goethe said to have said that everything has already been said, but not by everybody. So now it's my turn, and I want to be more concrete uh, and show you a project that's now some years old, but nonetheless urgent. Uh, that is a project that I undertook at the uh, Museum of Modern Art about sea level rise and the resiliency of cities. Uh, it's not exactly new information, but I think that it relates to a number of themes that have been brought together in this fantastic Biennale by Grafton uh, Architects. I think it relates to some of the central themes of the, um, of the manifesto, not only today's topic of Earth as client, but also of the very generosity that is at the heart of this uh, exhibition, the notion of reaching out to other creators and forming new ideas uh, in an interdisciplinary way. So let me launch into it, so to speak. Um, uh, I've titled this Curatorial Activism in an Age of Threats uh, and Shortages, and I think, in fact, that's what we see around us here in this Biennale. Um, oh, I have, a, I have a thing to advance the slides, yes. So the, the project I want to show you is called Rising Currents, Projects for New York's uh, Waterfront. Uh, and it culminated in an exhibition that you see here, but like uh, at the Museum of Modern Art uh, in 2010. Uh, rather poignantly, it closed exactly two years before Superstorm Standy uh, revealed some of the um, uh, unfortunate prophecy of this exhibition. But I don't so much want to deal with the problem of wading through high water that we dealt with this morning to get here, uh, but rather uh, how in that exercise we invited a group of people, architects, to form teams, interdisciplinary teams, to think really, I would say, about the Earth as client, but until today's invitation came, I hadn't really thought that that was our enterprise to think of the Earth as client, but what does it mean not only to dialogue with one another, but to dialogue uh, with the geographical, geological, uh, climatological facts that we have uh, been uh, given. These are analyses of the uh, flood zones of New York uh, on the left and on the right, the proposal of the U.S. Car Army Corps of Engineers where to place ga great gateways. It rather makes the New York Harbor look like a version of Venice and thinking of how you might defend it uh, through a hard infrastructure. Um, this is a project that actually was born at the Venice Biennale in 2008 uh, when we were sitting at the Cafe Paradiso uh, reading the morning newspaper, waiting for the gates to open, and the engineer Guy Nordensen told me about a project that he had undertaken, a kind of manifesto on the city using soft infrastructure sure, and working with nature, working with actually the earth as found rather than pouring concrete, rather than pouring architecture in as defense, rather a dialogue with the reality of the terrain, not only the terrain that we see, but the terrain that is largely underwater. He taught us to think about erasing the boundary in our mind between land and water, uh, but we turned it into, in our conversations in Venice, a project to begin to erode some of the boundaries between architecture, landscape design, hydrology, ecology, and think about the comprehensiveness with which the design professions need to work uh, to work in today's environment. In any case, Guy had presented me with his manifesto and said, should we put it in the Museum of Modern Art? I said, did you see this morning's newspaper? There, uh, Lehman Brothers has collapsed. There's going to be large unemployment. Young architects are going to do things like design uh, websites instead of working with the environment. What if we create a workshop at MoMA and invite groups to come together? So we invited them to move into underused spaces in MoMA's PS1 former schoolhouse, uh, and we invited them also to put together five architects, uh, one, four architects, one landscape designer, to put together dream teams. We said, the market gives you certain commissions, but don't bring the commission, the type of expertise that you would do for a market uh, uh, commission. Think of what would be the ideal team of people you would like to discuss with in order to create a project to rethink parts of New York uh, as places that will be agreeable to live in, even with rising sea levels and more frequent storms. 
Uh, and one of the key points here, and I think it has much to do with the environment that we're in here today in Venice, is that we, every couple of weeks, threw open these studios so that the public could come in and discuss with the designers who were hard at work. They did what the architecture students in the room will recognize as a pin-up, but they did it for the public, not simply for other professionals. For me, it was very important, and I think it's exciting to see so much of the public here at the Biennale, to begin to demystify the design process in a way to have a conversation between design uh, underway and the end results that, uh, in a sense, to erode the often popular notion that architects are arrogant rather than to realize the incredible thought processes and interaction uh, that goes into thinking of design solutions. There's the end product of the exhibition, but it was part of a, uh, really the end product of this um, long experiment. I only want to show you um, two of the projects very quickly and then pass on the microphone. I hope we can discuss uh, more what I like to to think of as the possibility of the exhibition as a powerful way of changing the public imagination. Two years after this exhibition was closed, I was called to the New York City office of, uh, mayor's office of emergency preparedness, and he, uh, the deputy of the mayor, asked me, we're, we're very impressed by rising currents. Now that we've had Sandy, we're eager to know what you're going to do next. And I said, I'm not doing anything next that is of immediate use to the problems of the city of New York. The role of a curator is to change the possibilities, I say, is to move the boundaries of what can be discussed. And I think that's what's happening here in this Biennale in the last few months, and that's what we tried to do uh, in New York, to change the boundaries of what can be discussed about climate change. And ultimately, in this, what became an iconic image, sort of washed back ashore with Sandy two years later, this is one of the projects that attempted to rethink Lower Manhattan, one of the uh, hardest hit places uh, in 2012 in Sandy, as with a green absorptive uh, skirt, we had learned to understand that an architectural section of the land extends to the seafloor. We learned uh, in all of the expertise that was brought to our weekly pinups and meetings about bathymetry, uh, and we all began to think and design differently uh, with the earth as a continuum from seafloor um, to uh, the landscape itself. So this uh, project by the architects LTL, working with the landscape designer Susanna Drake and a group of hydrologists, uh, proposed this absorptive land around Manhattan. The key uh, number of things here I think are of interest. One is that the image began to circulate from the workshops even before the exhibition opened. So the exhibition has this uh, expanding effect on public discourse. The other is it came out almost at the same time, this publication proposing a natural history of New York and we realized that the proposal was in a sense a archeological recovery of the original nature of New York uh, and therefore a kind of dialogue with the natural history of a site. Uh, which I think is something we see more and more coming to the fore in the last decade when architecture and landscape design have had such productive interrelations. Uh, another aspect of that was the proposal to uh, create these absorptive uh, streets, almost like uh, Melitta filters in the morning for creating your coffee, uh, with these porous uh, pavers and systems that would allow the streets uh, to absorb water and send it back to the sea. Uh, this is a key aspect of this uh, project for Lower Manhattan. And you can see here that this green skirt is a public park uh, during times when it's not flooded. So this, I suppose, is the key point I wanted to bring to you. Uh, the brilliance of this design proposal is something uh, that I also learned in the process of this discovery of the workshop with scores of people uh, coming together uh, for this six-week intense design exercise. Some of the sociologists who came and looked at it because we invited people to provide commentary and we asked sociologists to come and say, what do you think about these proposals in relationship to living in the city in the future? And they said, it's brilliant, you are creating what we call in sociology co-benefits. So that rather than simply solving the problem, how do I keep the water out? How do I make the city function? These architects also provided images 
that people who lived in this area saw and said, that would be a nice city to live in. I would love to live in a Manhattan that had kayaking and a green park on the edge. It didn't look at it and said, oh, we're going to, our feet will be dry because we have an absorptive skirt. So the transformation of the turning around of something from simply problem solving to the creation of a kind of generous free space uh, with multiple uh, benefits, I think, was one of the uh, lessons from this. I'll just conclude by showing one other of the five uh, astounding projects that uh, came out of this exercise. This was the only team run by a landscape designer, uh, Kate Orff, and she took a very difficult site uh, that includes the passage between Governor's Island uh, and Brooklyn, known as the, um, and the Gowanus Canal, which is one of the most polluted sites in America. And she proposed this panorama in which she wants to return to 1776, happily not to make America great again, but to uh, make New York City resilient for the future and learning the lessons of what was there, why when New York was the oyster capital of the world, uh, when the Gowanus was a tidal swamp with an extraordinary oyster life. She, like many others, has studied oysters and she proposes to bring oysters back into the area off of Brooklyn. You see her oyster coral reef uh, there in green, a kind of green tail to Governor's Island. But she wants to look at the life of an oyster. I don't know how many of you had a close conversation with an oyster, but the, one of the things that oysters do, do is that they clean the sea. They take something like five times their body mass and clean that amount of water uh, every day. So they are the vacuum cleaners of the sea. They're also highly social they form themselves almost immediately into dense reefs like coral, which change the bathymetry of the sea and make any sea surface a wave breaker that can break uh, the kind of surge, surge that we get with the tidal storms that are becoming more frequent with climate change in many parts of the world, but also in the East Coast of the United States. So the brilliant Kate Orff and her team including a natural scientist and hydraulic engineers, came up with the idea of transforming this technique which exists, which is for fostering young oysters, and turning the entire Bay of New York into an oyster hatchery, uh, where the oysters would then be moved to where they could be the most effective in turning the harbor of New York from what it is now, a dredged kind of um, surf, uh, surfing surface, to a rough surface that will make the city a natural absorber uh, of that. And she imagines in the end to create an aquatic park that could be visited, a national park uh, of oyster reefs, and even um, imagines uh, that oysters would return as a delicacy to lo local eateries. So I think you've got the point, is exhibitions as the capacity to rechange the public uh, dialogue on problems the incredible creative energy of an open, generous dialogue in interdisciplinary terms uh, that can provide uh, images that allow us to imagine uh, a resilient life that is desirable and not simply uh, defensive. The last slide is simply to remind us that there are many other problems out there in the water, and I think it is exercises like this that might help us imagine turning the continents of garbage that we uh, or flying over too often uh, into perhaps a design solution. But I haven't got the answer to that. One needs to convene uh, a group of creative individuals to help us move the boundaries of our discourse. So, thank you. Um, thank you. I would like to thank um, the Biennale and the curators for this opportunity to introduce our Songyang story. Um, can we have the file, please? Yeah. Can we have the file on the screen? There we go. Um, Songyang is a small county in China with 400 villages. This is the region with a beautiful landscape tea plantations, ancient villages, and critical issues. 
Most rural communities are in economic decline and losing faith in the village's future. Young people move to the cities for employment. Many villages become hollow with low population in elders. There is an urgent need to establish new hope for local communities. Here we propose the earth as patient. With architectural acupuncture as the healing treatment. With the minimal intervention approach, a public program is introduced to each village according to its context and heritage to serve the rural uh, village and community to establish a rural identity and to open up to tourism and, economic, uh, and to stimulate economic development. These are the buildings we've been collaborating with the county in the past five years. Um, today I will introduce six villages. First is the Pintian Village Center. Um, this is a renovation of abandoned villager houses by using local building techniques, such as um, tenant amortis, wooden structure. This becomes a village center for exhibitions, artist studio, and rooms for homestay business. After its completion in 2015, together with the rural tourism development, more and more people, villagers, moved back. The total number of village inhabitants have increased from 20 to over 100 in the last three years. Xing Village is well known for its brown sugar production. The traditional cooking process is a striking life performance, but the family workshops were in poor conditions. A new factory is programmed with the main production space as a central stage to invite visitors and tourists. The factory has increased the sugar price and village economic revenues in the last two years. During off production season, the factory is also used as a village social space. Hakka Indenture Museum um, is built by local stone construction to connect the village with the mountain and also to create an archaeological space contemplating the history of Hakka Indenture. In the beginning of the construction, we could only find three skilled masonry workers in the whole region and they trained over a dozen young workers after the construction. The building follows an existing drainage on the site, inviting villagers to pass through. Next is the Shimen Bridge. Um, with the new bridge built for, for vehicles, this is a new bridge for vehicles built nearby. The old Shimen Bridge was under discussion whether to be demolished. So we propose to preserve it for the for pedestrian by adding a new wooden lounge that follows the rhythm of the bridge structure and stops in the center as a viewing platform. This bridge becomes a public space shared by two villages across the water and is also used by local people as a marketplace. Um, the ancestor Wang Jin's memorial hall in Wang village is to restore the identity and pride of an ancient village that is surrounded by modern factories. While the building stays quiet on its exterior, the interior is articulated by integrating Wang Jin's 
life moments with building structure into memorial corners. The visitors, uh, the villagers are proud to visit as if they are walking through the timeline of the ancestors' life. Unlike some villages in the country with massive investments for tourism, Songyang, our Songyang um, acupuncture method works within limited budget to engage and motivate local communities. The last one is an, a simple exercise in a bamboo forest. The villagers can easily build and maintain this open space in the nature. We think this is a metabolic architecture. Thank you. I would like to, to start congratulating Yvonne and Shelly Shelly for this uh, so interesting Biennale. And I thank them a lot for bringing me here to this uh, conversation. Uh, when did I thought about what to say, I thought that without uh, having ready any general statement about this relationship between Earth as client, the best uh, for me was uh, coming with uh, some project. Uh, happily, it has happened. Uh, the latest project I finished that has to do with the Earth. We need help. No? Doesn't work. No? I'm sorry. It is a project that, that has to do with theirs both in terms of landscape or how to reacting against a well-established landscape, as well as has something to do with the, the earth itself, because it's a winery and the, the owner, the, the best and the best, the best known enologists in Spain, very much wanted to leave the wine to be uh, resting on the interior inside the, the, the earth, in the most that in the ground. And therefore... Sorry, there, there seems to be some technical problem. Do you want to switch to the next speaker? And that's then fine. they have a little... Right. Oh, Wonderful. Just, just to Thank explain, there's some technical problem that will take a few minutes to, um, to uh, rectify. So, uh, Rafael uh, very kindly has agreed and uh, if our next speaker, uh, Simone, doesn't mind coming on board immediately and we'll solve the technical problem. You're, you're okay, you're okay. So, uh, apologies. Apologies. I hope mine is working then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. At least. First, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to participate. I'm honored to be part of this almost last meeting on architecture in the Biennale. And I'm, uh, I've written my text down because of the five minutes, because otherwise I would extend more. And then we can discuss later, and we have more time for that. So, um, A city of comings and goings, the contribution of my office, Crimson Architecture Historians, that deals with mi migration, is in different ways connected to the theme. Of the earth as a client, but. <laughs> I 
I wanted to show something on that. Ah, oh. No. Oh. This is the last slide. It's a quick talk. Yes, very quick. I don't know what's the point. Do I? Yeah. This is it, yeah. Uh, but the most, so, um, is in different ways connected to the theme of today, the Earth as our client, but the most tangible one is, I'm afraid, not the most positive. Climate change and conflicts caused by us humans and changing the state of the Earth are the major push factors for migration and drove millions of people's, people from their homes. Thinking about what really connects our work to the Earth, it is the research of the human intervention at the Earth, especially on its urban aspects. In this case, the movement of the people on the earth, the comings and goings. It's not very... Although the refugee crisis pushed us to the theme of migration, we have tried to zoom out. A city of comings and goings is about the Western European city and how it deals with migration. The Western European city is one of the highest value destinations of people everywhere in the world, rich or poor, free or oppressed, to work or to study, to thrive or to merely survive. But it is finding it increasingly hard to deal with the timeless reality of migration. Migrants are being associated with ghettos, crime, terrorism, or with rising real estate values, Disney-fied inner cities, and gentrification. Migration is driving us apart, yet it is the one thing that we all have in common, the pursuit of happiness. In a, state of, in a city of comings and goings, we zoom out from the immediacy of refugee crisis and catastrophes, and we try to see migration and cities as historically and fundamentally connected. We zoom out from the singular, temporary, acute design intervention and try to redefine what is expected from architecture to make our cities strong and robust so they can absorb the comings and goings of cities over centuries. Try to change the perspective through research, stories and strategies. What is needed in terms of architecture and urbanism so that our cities are actually profit, uh, actually profit and grow from migration? Being architecture historians, we address this topic of migration first through research, because we think that working on the city always should start with research. Within interdisciplinary approach, we question, can stories and a new narrative influence strategies on the city? Based in Rotterdam, we have developed a hybrid practice that takes the contemporary city as its object. We design for the city, we research it, write text and books about it, show it in exhibitions and works of art, teach about it, and give advice on it. And strongly connected to this practice, just recently we launched, we launched a school, a free space. The independent school for the city that builds on the belief that strategies for the city, architectural and economic, spatial and social, should be based on real, first-hand, empirical research into the city. The school will provide an interdisciplinary program for postgraduate students from all over the world in the field of design, planning, sociology, history, and for whoever would feel comfortable with the job description urbanist. Its unaccredited status will offer the students and their international teachers the full intellectual freedom and flexibility to not only research the city in the broadest sense, but also design and develop strategies for it. In the mission statement of the school, we say the following on what drives us, and that is at the same time what we like. Some quotes. We like complexity and contradiction in cities. We want to celebrate it, discover it, show it, and we want to defend it against the forces that are making everything the same, compatible, approachable, smooth and polished. We like the complexity, complexity of our inner city streets front, uh, fronts, <clears throat> defined by centuries-old architectural memes, from neo-Gothic ornamentation to social democratic red brick housing, 80s neo-modernist apartments and 15, 50s aspirational modernism. 
We like how the architectural history is overlaid with signage in Dutch, Polish, Arabic, Russian, Turkish, Chinese, and any language. We like the contradictions of modernity in African cities, where the newest gadgetry makes it possible to live in a metropolitan way without actually having to build a metropolis. We also like social scientists and philosophers who have left academia and gone into the field and have come back with literary masterpieces that have inspired generations of artists, scholars, architects and historians. We like filmmakers who have become architects and we like architects who have given up on designing and building and have become filmmakers, artists and politicians. And we like a lot of more, but especially we like migration because it makes our lives more complex and more contradictory. It forces us to forget ourselves and to remember what we really want. It makes us better and worse people. It kills neighborhoods and makes them come alive again. It saves us while wiping everything away that we thought we believed in. <coughs> and we like migration because it connects our corner shops and dinner tables and school and hospitals and television sets to places where we never would want to go. This brings me back to our contribution here in Venice, the ongoing research a city of comings and goings, because migration is one of the pillars which the independent school for the city is built on. <coughs> a free space for researching the city in all its complexity and contradiction. A free space for learning in, in, in an interdisciplinary critical way and exchange and implement knowledge with the earth or the world as our client. Thank you. Well, mine is not going to be. Yes. Mine is not going to be, a, let's say, such a an important declaration as those that I have listened till now. It is going to be simply the expression of how I react with the, my latest building to something that I believe has to do with the earth. I think that here earth for me was landscape. How the building that was going to be a winery should be installed that they are without damaging too much this landscape of a small village in the north of Spain. Therefore, the building ties instead of just making, and, uh, let's say, a statement with its presence, trying to, to follow in, trying to, to respect even the, the profile and the skyline of the, the existing mountains, and uh, it works uh, in a way that uh, doesn't try to, to impose, at, at, at most it will try to remind about the old villages of the remainings of, of all, uh, either uh, all protective huts in the mountains, but uh, it needed also to be related with the earth, with the heart of the earth itself. It was the, the winery and the owner very much wanted to have the, the wines resting just so close as possible of, as possible of the rock. The, therefore, grapes are starting to go down from the, the, the recipient 
the space that, that happens to be above and then move in a way that at the end the bottles are able to go out from there. But the, 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 the graves and the elaboration itself is it's going to happen just uh, looking for this heart of the earth, as I said, you see there the, the, the barrels and just at, at, at the end, the, the, the rock, the, the, the rock that uh, wants uh, the, to be reached and wants uh, to be reached also in a way that, that, that at the end, the entire architectural event can be seen almost as people allowing to go down throughout those stairs from the highest levels to the lowest where and therefore the stairs are so important in this design the, the, this sense of, of just making a building that actually establishes the con contact and connects it directly with the, the most the profound soil is uh, what the, the, the entire building is about. The, 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 the what that emerges is, is just uh, the, the tip of an iceberg when the, the, the entire thing that happens inside. To do something and to, if uh, I ought to do some kind of a statement, I would say that uh, try to be so respectful as possible with what, with the so-called natural landscape. The, the, don't believe that we are not hurting and the, the, trying to, to be so economical as possible. Don't believe that whatever gesture you do on the earth today is going to go through without having a tremendous impact. Being so intrinsically economic as possible in the use of, of the soil and the ground is, is the all that this building wants to say about. And then just uh, thinking in the use that the, the building has that this uh, winery is uh, still say that many of the things that we like to do still needs uh, this direct contact with this uh, reality that is not just the, the outdoor, the, the surface of the, of the earth, but just the heart and then the earth as is more inner reality. And I think that's, that's all. I think that later in the conversation, I very much would like to follow up some of the issues that has been raised. But in the meanwhile, take my presentation as just a simple example of how an architect reacts when Actually, it is not the city anymore, the client, but you, well, I suppose that it would be the earth who, in this case, made to me the commission. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd just like to say that um, it's been a fantastic pleasure to hear the five of you speak because from the very beginning of our uh, thinking about the, the Biennale, we, we wanted to stretch uh, from architecture, the kind of intimate uh, ideas and tactile nature of architecture to the, to the bigger issues of what we do as a profession. And from uh, Raphael's description of that, every time we have a glass of wine now, we think of the barrel just close to the rock somewhere in Spain. That, that we, even in the everyday things that we do, that the earth and ourselves as process um, uh, are intimately connected. And I think that what I find listening to, to these uh, uh, five guests uh, this afternoon is that when we had the project uh, uh, in Greenland uh, represented, uh, which is an extreme condition. And then we hear about the permafrost uh, being affected in Greenland. We see the samples in the Biennale of uh, the project in Manhattan, which is also uh, Barry Bergdahl uh, discussed in terms of the impact on, on cities. 
and when we talk about the, the film uh, uh, Il Capo, which describes the, the carving into the mountains to get Carrara marble, uh, uh, Shelley and I and our team really wanted to discuss the earth as client and how to make architects and to make the general public aware of the uh, impact and necess necessity of interdisciplinary moving forward in terms of, of the earth. And when, when Mary Robinson talked, I think it's really very beautifully and uh, optimistically when you talk that you talk about the necessary uh, culture, the kind of culture of imagination to help the problems. And Barry's last slide of the, the kind of debris and the various seas and plastic and the impact we're having on the earth, we now know what we do as human beings, whether you're architects or not, we have impacts. And what's beautiful about the Chinese samples is that when you see the bending of bamboo to make a, a theater, when you take resources, that it's not only a bent bamboo, it's a beautiful thing. And also just out from here uh, is a beautiful piece from Vietnam, uh, which is made totally of bamboo. And the architects, when they came here with their workmen, were also talking about bamboo as contemporary steel because of the ability to bamboo to renew itself, but also its capacity structurally. And I, I suppose from my point of view, listening to you all and then listening in terms of cities of comings and goings, that the, the real impact that we live in, in Western Europe in such wonderful conditions in comparison to many other people. And as you describe, um, uh, that, that, that a Western European city is a kind of a, um, a dream place for many people. That we have to uh, look at the earth, how we deal with cities, how we think I'm just, I suppose from my point of view, the, creation, the, the creativity necessary to answer some of the problems that uh, began with Mary Robinson. Maybe we, we begin in terms of the power of architecture to present ideas, to have a place for ideas, to change ideas, a bit like you were saying, Barry. Maybe we discuss that for a short time, that how do you change people's perception? How long does it take? Is this different now because of the media structure, because of the internet? Maybe we begin with our colleague here. Yeah, we talked about it a bit before, because uh, when, we, when we talk about migration, um, we compare it also to, I think, 20 years ago, when the, in the Kosovo and, and Czech uh, part, the, uh, Czech, uh, Yugoslavia, was the, the war also then, uh, 50,000 migrants came to Holland. It's the same amount as there is now. And then we were wondering, what's the difference? Why is it so such a problem at this moment? And then one of the conclusions was the social media, because 20 years ago it was totally different from how it was per perceived now through, because everybody was talking about it. And about. So, it, because 20 years ago, of course, there were also some problems and some things, but when you look at it now, this, this, the, the people uh, who came to, to Holland live there and it just are also with us and living, uh, living in the city. And suddenly now with the refugee crisis uh, um, from 2015, it became such a, such a thing also in Holland. And, um, but what we try to do is try to, to, to make it, um, try to, to zoom out what I just said, just to, to bring it more to, indeed, how can we as architects or architecture historians or researchers first identify what happened in those, also in those 20 years when, when a big group of migrants came to, to the cities, what, has, what is the, the, the history of that, What's the, and, and how can we learn from that already now? So because we are thinking there are many examples also at this moment in public space and in different buildings that in which the city already adapted but we don't we didn't only show good examples also uh, the bad examples just to try to learn from it but i think the difference uh, talking about media then it, that it's uh, from 20 years ago is 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 how people are talking about it and showing it and and, and so this is very strongly connected to uh, to what happened
Yeah, I, I'm just finding it, it fascinating to even um, have seen the projects that we've seen presented on this panel um, as being examples of how we can think differently. And I'd like to see so much more of that because of the short time we have to change from business as usual and not do it unfairly on the backs of the wrong workers, for example. Um, if we're going to have 45% reduction in emissions, then we need to ch close power plants quickly. My understanding is there's the Urgenda case in the Netherlands, where the Netherlands government now, through a court order, has to, re has to reduce by 25%. You have four car um, power plants, they have to close, there's no plan. Um, will it happen suddenly and leave those workers desperate, or will there be a plan a plan, um, you know, a whole sense of an inclusive um, involvement of those communities in their future, in how they will go forward and have retraining, pensioned off, new skills and new industry going into those areas. And this has to happen on a massive scale. And more than that, we have to stop driving our economies on promoting our consumption. Look at this ridiculous Black Friday and Christmas coming earlier and earlier and all this consumption, consumption, it's madness because it's what's destroying us. And yet, culturally, we're not hearing enough um, that we can have a great life, a very satisfying life, less mental illness, much less health problems of you know, air quality, etc. And I, I would love to see real cultural leadership on this, real sensing, you know, uh, I was at a, a, a book launch in England of my climate justice book, um, just the other day, and I was asked two questions from the floor, but what's the narrative that will move people in a positive way? And I, I kind of hadn't digested that question until I went through this morning, and I realized this morning, this is the narrative that will help greatly, and we just need to intensify and take responsibility. The cultural world has to take responsibility to help us um, in a very serious, engaged way with the fact that the Earth is our client and we are seeing the Earth um, suffering from bad doctors <laughs> who are doing the wrong thing. Um, and, uh, you know, that we need to really, really change. And I love what you're doing in China. And what I loved when you were explaining earlier about your acupuncture um, architecture is that you, there is a connection between the villages and they see that connection. Can you speak to that a little bit? Um, the acupuncture refers to the um, small injections on key spots, but to, ac uh, to activate the body, to activate the whole circulation in the whole body. And, and all these acupuncture in different villages, they, they're not only to activate in, inside this village, but also to bring the interconnections in between the villages. Um, for example, the other the Pintian villagers will come to the Xin village to buy the brown sugar product and go to the Hakka village for their Hakka cultural performance. Um, and actually in the next phase, we, as we said, we have 20 projects in different locations in the whole, in whole county. We're also building tofu factory um, in one village and uh, rice wine uh, factory in another village. All this becomes an economical circulation as well. And the porcelain factory can produce the for, a porcelain as packaging for rice wine or for brown sugar. So they create their own economical circulation as well. These are becoming a whole system mapping to the whole county. Um, Chen Chen, you make it sound so simple. Can I just ask, because I think the questions that are being raised is um, calling on the cultural community for a narrative is, is a really key question. And Yvonne and I were speaking this morning <clears throat> actually about conversations we had with Brother and Paolo Barata. What were we as, as curators doing about the big issues? And we had this very interesting conversation that architecture has to operate at the micro and the macro scale. And that this is partly to do with the fact that architects are not in positions of power, but also to do with um, that every act of making has a, a, a political uh, content, let's say, architecturally, which we see from Raphael's project, thinking about digging into the earth and your projects. 
Can I just ask two things? Maybe you could answer first. Um, how, what kind of structure allows you to operate like this? Is it just you as um, an inspired and inspiring person who wanders the mountains and connects communities and, and uh, industries together? Or is there some answer in terms of the support structure that you have culturally or socially or politically? Because we don't have that um, possibility, for in instance, to operate in the way that you're describing. And then it would be good for, for me to know what each, perhaps each of the presenters thinks about this thing of operating both at the acupunctural and micro scale and the big strategies and big issues because very often we feel that we are powerless in the weight of the problems within the, the kind of um, huge pressures that there are uh, today on our society and, and on our earthest lines. You feel very often powerless but you are um, saying, you both are saying that every project we make can make a difference. But I would like to know what it is that allows you to, to make this kind of cohesive intervention in this whole district. Um, the, uh, the title of the, our exhibition is called Songyan Story. So it's not only about architecture. I mean, um, the, the, the goal is not architecture. Or on the other hand, the buildings are just the beginning of the whole um, story. Um, and the Songyang story is actually a systematic whole, um, how do you say, a, a social practice. Uh, it becomes a, a systematic social pr practice. But it started back to five years ago when we first, did, uh, first visited Songyang and we saw all these beautiful ancient villages that are in these um, poor conditions. So we, we went through the, some of the villages, or like the, the tea plantations, by proposing small scale projects. Let's say we, in the beginning, we did a bamboo pavilion in a tea plantation. And then the Pintian Village Center was the first village pro project we proposed to the government that. Um, um, because at the, at the moment, nobody believed in the future of a village or these buildings could have a, a potential. So we proposed to, to the government that, okay, we will design it for free and the government will uh, sponsor for the construction of these uh, buildings into a public uh, center for the village. So that's how we started so one by one. At what level? And the county, the county government, yes. Um, so this this started uh, with you know a, a one by one small uh, projects, but also the, the the scale of the project has to be sensitive. Uh, depends on the context of each village. Um, so eventually, we collaborate with the county government to look into different villages, um, and this become a acupuncture strategy in the whole county region. Um, um, and of course, uh, in the whole process, we engage with the local construction workers um, and also the communities. And a lot of buildings here, you, 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 uh, you could identify there by different um, um, construction method or material. It's really according to the, the, the context of each village. Again, for example, the ancestor hall, um, the stone carving, um, it's because um, we have the, the village is in uh, are surrounded by the factories, and there's a, a stone carving factory just right out of the village. So we just take this uh, um, technique and work with the buildings. So everything comes in a, a how do you say convenient way, um, or maybe we're just lazy. Um, but yeah, we, it was really to work with. Um, the whole community, the whole context, and also uh, the government in the county government, the um, town, uh, the town government, and also village as a collective uh, community. Um, and this project keeps going on, and, and uh, we are working with a new chapter of rural economy at the next phase. Would, would anybody else like to speak?
I guess that the, the, the issue of scale is uh, so important because we have seen in all the, the images of New York flooded. If uh, we are considering, let's say, the, the, the space, the time coordinates for seeing how it has happened, probably we will need to talk about hundreds, thousands, millions of years. Who is going to take measures just with such a broad consideration of what is going to happen? Therefore, I think that all the, the, the panel, as well as the audience, has been so much caught by Tian Tian intervention that are just reinforcing this, this sense of working, that we are able to, to work in this uh, uh, small scale intervention. You, you has mentioned a couple of times the small, and, and I, I realize that we should accept and we should define where we should, let's say, insist in, the, in just working in advantage of this much more general definition of what to be done. Surely with, with this climate pressure that, that we are thinking, everybody believes that measures ought to be taken. But in the meanwhile, we are not going to build the dam just for preventing Venice to be flooded down in the Adriatic. In, 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 at, but at the end, we, sh we should try to find out the, what the, to be done in the day-by-day day in the intervention. I, it is difficult to, to, to establish this, uh, let's say, I don't like the word coordination, but this sense of, of working in both the scales of, of time, good direction, in that, that we are closer to understand how it works of uh, daily intervention with this other much more larger direction to, to act. And, and therefore, uh, I think that that is what comes out and comes out in a day that is so flagrant, flagrant and evident that, that something ought to be done. But when you are thinking Venice uh, has uh, 15, 16, 1700 years of existence, and you say, well, what has changed? Or if uh, the entire city has been built, what, how we are daring to find out in those almost geological changes to, to be protected? I, I would like to think in much more short way. I, I realize that short way views are not so well seen, and, and yet are those that we are able to master. And, and therefore, good behavior, good direction for our daily world is what actually we would like to, to, to find out. Um, can I just give a, a different kind of example, because I'm not obviously an architect and I didn't have my PowerPoint. I have a different way of um, trying, um, but I do have access to power circles as a former president, as a former, et cetera. And um, uh, one of the ways in which we tried to address the climate issue was by getting women leaders to come together on gender and climate change. And there was every good reason to do this because the gender dimensions of climate change are enormous. If you start to undermine poor livelihoods, who picks up the pieces? Who has to still put food on the table? Who goes further in a drought for water, further for firewood? And so, all over the world, women are coping in a frontline way with the shocks and distortion of climate change. And so, um, I, um, you remember the Copenhagen conference, which more or less failed. And then the year afterwards, there was a conference in Mexico, in Cancun, a climate conference. And we realized that there had been three women. Two of them had presided already over conferences. Connie Hedegaard in Copenhagen, um, Patricia Espinosa was the foreign minister of Mexico, and the following year in Durban, it would be Mighty Mashaban. So we brought those three women together, and we called it the Troika Plus of Women Leaders on Gender and Climate Change. And my small foundation was the Secretariat. 
And we got, we made a big impact, you know, though I say, you know, the Troika did, it, working with a women's constituency to get gender into the whole climate world, which was a very male world. It had grown out of scientists and environmentalists who cared about nature, but not so much about people. And that was the, the climate world at that time. And we gradually got gender into it. And then the, um, and this is the local, the connection I'm trying to make now between the um, uh, global and the local. The Troika um, of women leaders on gender and climate decided, well, we're at the table. They were either ministers of environment, ministers of foreign affairs, ministers of energy, um, but also heads of UN agencies and powerful women. Um, they would be able to make space for grassroots, indigenous, local voices. And for the last few years, this is what has been happening. And that has made a huge difference to the conversation because the delegates who come to climate conferences think they know and they do know the UN speak of climate and the paragraphs and the numbers and the statistics and the blah, blah, blah of climate, but they don't feel it the way these voices insist on talking about climate when they get into the room, when they're allowed to be at the table. And, you know, a number of them are in the book on climate justice that I've written now. And one of them, you know, Hindu, um, is a pastoralist from um, Chad. Um, her first foreign language would be French, coming from Chad, but she also has very good English. Very, very bright. She became chair of the Indigenous People's Forum. She has now addressed the UN Security Council. She addresses conferences of climate. She's there in panels, looking beautifully dressed, young, and a voice that needs to be heard. And there are lots of other voices now that are coming of, because they have the expertise, they actually know how to cope with the very real changes that need to take place in their community. They need to grow different crops. They need to um, rebuild the school that's been destroyed by a flood. They need to plant trees. They need, you know, and it's that kind of sense of a courage to do. And when they talk about it in that way, it does affect the decision making. And so, um, you know, I think if, if people knew more about your acupuncture um, uh, architecture and what you're doing in China at the higher levels, it would help. And I, if we can get these stories out of, you know, how, and I love your migrant um, uh, issues, and, you know, I, lo I love the way you say so positively, I love migration. We need to hear more of that. We need to hear it, you know, with good examples. Yeah, what I want to add to your story about the, the gender, but also about the big and smaller scale is that I think it's at least that's what we experience. It's very important not to underestimate the role of design in this kind of bringing it together because the bigger scale bringing like the, the government or the, the, the local authorities bringing to the grassroots, you could do it with design research by design. So letting people using design as a tool to, to bring this together and to, to, to get the stories of what's really happening and then try to integrate it in the strategies on, or policies. So design is very important, I think. Architecture and urban design. I think you, you put it so well because it, I don't think it's simply an issue for architects, the challenge to think at both the micro scale and the macro scale. And um, I suppose just another anecdote from the front, as it were, um, one of the things that became abundantly clear in the rising currents experiment at, um, at MoMA uh, was simultaneously the issue that we all have, how do we not even as individuals feel so completely overwhelmed that there's really no reason to do anything because it's all hopeless and what does our single action matter, whereas all of these single actions indeed add up. And I suppose in my presentation I spoke a little bit more to the ways in which architects have capacity through design to give us images that are, are, are motiva motivating uh, <clears throat> for, you know, for contributing at the individual level. But one of the most uh, perhaps disturbing discoveries of that experiment was we suspended all existing regulations and rules. We said you don't worry about the fact that the site that you're using uh, for your design exercise belongs to 35 different individuals. Some of it is municipal, some of it is private. Don't worry about the fact that this site that we've chosen goes across the state line between New York and New Jersey or that the underwater depends on the port authority and the ground depends on the etc, etc. Uh, and we kept inviting public officials in to uh, 
uh, to do two things. Simultaneously, to give a sense of weighted importance for these very young designers who were there, the public officials were paying attention to them. But since the public officials were not the clients, I suppose the earth was momentarily the client, um, the uh, public officials uh, were also thinking all along, well, how would we actually do this? And the most startling moment came when I got a request from the Commissioner of Parks to convene a meeting at the Museum of Modern Art of all of the agencies in New York who would be involved in making such a project happen because they said, you have the capacity to do it. We don't talk to the people in the transportation department. We're incapable of having contact with the Port Authority. Uh, you seem to be getting all these people together. Uh, could you hold a meeting at MoMA so that we could all discuss this together? And then you realized the impediments, and at least at the local level of New York, the, the crisis of the inability of inherited structures of how land is managed and all of the things that really matter uh, to cope with the urgent creative solutions. So that's just unfortunately an observation. But, but th no, that's exactly what I'm talking about. That's what culture has to do now. It has to actually convene and get us out of our business as usual boxes and um, you know, regulations that are, I don't mean um, take away good regulations, but, but the ones that would impede what, where we need to go. And culture is trusted, and that's important. But isn't it interesting uh, that, that when uh, Barry is talking about MoMA, that it took, if you like, an art institution to open its doors as a kind of a neutral space. I mean, that's what kind of confirms your thesis today, saying that culture has the answer. And, and I'm not sure in, uh, in uh, Tizian's uh, description of acupuncture, whether the motivation comes because of uh, being able to use uh, the power of students and teaching that you come from, is it from a professional position that you then have this acupuncture within uh, the, the, the world of this part of China? That, that it, does it come, the, the question Shell, uh, Shelley had earlier on, is it that it comes from a professional uh, questioning of um, change? Is it coming from uh, theory and thinking and um, when I hear about MoMA opening its doors at a time when there's a, a, a crisis it's just very interesting that we're here at the Venice Biennale we had set up kind of free space a place for thinking and then today is the earth as client and what do we do both as uh, as architects doing tiny projects or architects interdisciplinary discussions how do we get it to a point where it's normal that the boundaries are being jumped. We're not in the various categories. And we've had experience uh, recently of something exactly what Barry is saying, where normally the various disciplines of road, of access, of parks are separate. When you sit them down in a room and share a story, then they become, oh, I see, it. I'm not going to stay so uh, strictly in that mindset because I see the value of something else. So maybe there needs to be either the uh, institutions of art or culture opening their doors as interdisciplinary workshops. I mean, I love that idea on the cusp of the crisis that you open your doors and ideas come forward. Maybe what we need to do, or maybe that's what a biennale is, it's a kind of every an architectural biennale, is a, a, a chance to read kind of Crimson's piece, is to see a barrel of, of wine leaning up against a rock as a practicing architect embeds himself into the, into the earth. How do we set up, do we, is it about just changing thinking so that more institutions open their doors? Because I think, as you said, Barry, there's a, what did you say, the, the crisis of structures, that the structures keep us apart, so engineers, deal with all the sewage and all the water, and as architects, we ignore that and just put water into containers, as opposed to synthesizing the earth into how we design. So how do we, I suppose the question is, if there's a crisis of structure, of structures, how do we break that? Shall I start? A well, on our experience is that um, 
I think when you talk about the rural, it's quite different from the, the city where you have all these institutions like MoMA and then the city of New York or the city of Paris is engaging, is promoting all these constructions on, on public facilities. And rural is, at least in China, well, back to four or five years ago, rural region is the forgotten land. Um, so at that time in the beginning i think architects can when we when we first arrived uh, i think architects can initiate and uh, propose something but little by little that's how we started and but then when the local communities they they saw the result they will when it, they will believe it. In the beginning, it was al always a doubt, struggle. Um, but I think this is a by real um, process um, happening on the land, that you work with the local community to engage them from the beginning. Um, and then they, um, they become part of the, um, the effort. And they also, uh, when, when the community is motivated, they would initiate on further development in the village or further, um, um, let's say, uh, they renovate their uh, abandoned ancestors' halls or they start up like a service um, business uh, or tourism um, business in a village. So they do engage. These are the things that architects can't do. And we couldn't plan that ahead of time. But, but yes, by acu this is by acupuncture. You, small with the sm uh, you start with a small needle, small injection, but it will come with the after effect, uh, one after another. Um, and I think this is the, uh, we need to t think about the structure with the time dimension. Instead of you plan everything in the beginning, and maybe the result didn't happen in a way as you planned. Or we really engage with the whole, uh, with the whole social practice and see how, how it goes and then that will bring up its own um, progression. Um, and I think this is how when we, we talk about the, the structure, maybe we should really engage with this kind of a multiple dimensional instead of a, a government or a institute like MoMA initiating um, or lead, let's say, um, planning ahead. I would say it's more like you initiate, but then it will grow, it will, it will develop on its own too. We might uh, open up the discussion uh, to the audience and maybe there are some questions that could be put to the, to the panel from the floor. Are there people who would like to ask some questions of our panel? Hello, I have a question concerning the title because the title, The Earth as a Client, I really like the title. Uh, for me, the question is, uh, normally as an architect, you have to ask the client what he want, what he need. And now we have to ask the nature because if the, if the nature is our client, we have to speak with, with the animals, we have to speak with the trees. And so for me, it's the question how animals and trees can get a, a voice. Because we are humans, we are speaking about topics, but how we can bring uh, a voice to these, these animals and the, the trees or the, the plants that we, that we have a discussion on a way that every, every part of the whole world has, a, has a, vo a voice. And that's for me a very, very important uh, questions, a question. Maybe there could be uh, research people, biologists, which, which can speak uh, for uh, animals or for plants. And for me, the question is, what do you think, how we can in integrate this part, which is very important when, when we have the, the Earth a, as client? Um. When you ask this, then I'm thinking, of course, I'm reacting from my own practice. But um, 
last in September I was in uh, Nairobi. We were working on a new town there. There is going to be a new town built just in the outskirts of Nairobi. So there's nature. And what we experienced is that the developer just who owns the land is building a city there. And then what we brought in is that we said, okay, but let's first research what the landscape, how it's working, which animals are living there, which plants are there, and how could you integrate this into the, um, to the plan for this new town. So it's a rather big developer with money, real estate developer. And he was listening to us. He was saying, okay, let's first do that before we uh, continue, no, not continue, but progressing planning. And so then you integrate, or I don't know if the earth then is your client in this way, but I think it's very necessary that you uh, um, first look at what's there before you, as a human, start doing something on a location wherever. So it, either it's in the landscape or in a city, just look at what's there and maybe also you can decide that, it's, that you can, um, can uh, build anyway, but then you know what's there. So that's, I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but that's my reaction to it. Um. I just think that um, uh, Pope Francis in his encyclical on climate change had a very holistic approach. I mean, he talked about us all being connected, the ecosystems of our world, that we have to live in harmony. And, you know, I think he brought that further than many other people in, in just in his intellectual capacity to see it in that very holistic way and advise and then talk in terms of the negatives of what we're doing, you know, that's cutting across that, and in particular, the overconsumption, the overuse of resources, the, um, the, the harm that's being done to our world, um, harming our client. Um, so I, I think that was, that was very useful. I mean, it, it, your question does go to the extremely difficult issue of what happens when the designer is put in a conflict between the uh, client embodied in an individual and the client that might be embodied in, in, in a way, responding to the earth and having a, uh, a greater sensitivity, what it for a long time would have simply been called site specificity, but I think now takes on a, a dimension of, of ecology, which is not only complex systems, but complex systems over time. Um, and all that I can think of is the, perhaps the ability as part of a design to run almost to run negative scenarios of what are the, um, what are the long-term deficits of a short-term decision because, um, and it does put a lot more responsibility, I think, on the, uh, on the architect in a way of being able to become a, a spokesperson for the earth through some kind of uh, sense of, uh, of projection. Uh, over time. It's probably not a very easy thing to ask for, but it is, your question is fascinating because it, it you know, it's just one more dimension of the way that the very profession of the architect is between, uh, between a, a social responsibility and often a, a request or a commission uh, that comes from the outside, as it were. Um, I would like to say something on this. Um, since we crossed out the, um, the client in our title, we put it in as the earth as a patient. And I think um, when you say client, it means you are still a provide, you're providing a service as to respond to. And again, it involves a contract, right? Um, commercial um, contract. Um, but then we, we would like to say maybe this is a different way. We look at the, the architecture. We are the doctors, maybe, that we can initiate um, targeting the problems and as a treatment, as a, a healing treatment. Um, in that way, um, your architectural approach might be different as well. You would not look, you, you might wonder, let's say if you perform a surgery um, as a dentist, you would try to keep the, the tooth as much as possible uh, and make the most efficient treatment. Instead of take out the tooth and then planting a gold or a diamond as a decoration. So I think in that way, it change, changes your perception on how we work as an architect. I attended the uh, UN conference Rio Plus 20, that was 20th anniversary of 
uh, you know, the important UN document on, uh, on climate change, which in some ways was a dismal event because it was, needless to say, uh, a disappointing record of, 20, of two decades. But someone, and I wish I could remember precisely who, someone there said one of the simplest things, but it was so incredibly enlightening in terms of simply flipping the, the way that we need to think. Uh, the person said, you know, we have this terrible habit of referring to the fact that we are destroying the earth. We're not destroying the earth, we're destroying ourselves. The earth will still be here once we have managed to actually make it impossible for us to inhabit it. Um, and, Yes. Yes. And I think that, I, but it is such an important perception, and it goes to how do you shift the perception uh, from thinking that we're simply not being friendly to the earth, to thinking that by not being friendly to the earth, we're doing ourselves in. <laughs> you know, it, it's a very good way of thinking about things that if we manage to destroy ourselves, and we could. You know, it is possible that we could. We've, we've already caused the extinction of quite a lot of species, and we're having the acidification of the oceans. And, you know, we could see that scenario in a very... The Earth will recover very rapidly when we're gone. Um, you know, it's, it's a remarkable thing. Um, uh, so I, I think, you know, in that way... Um, and, and at the moment, and this is the other thing from a climate point of view, and this is the frightening thing, the Earth at the moment is our big friend in absorbing carbon. Despite our bad habits, the Earth is trying very hard with its forests, with its oceans, to absorb as much carbon as possible. But my understanding from the scientists is when we get above the two degrees, that can have the loopbacks where the Earth becomes our enemy and begins to spew out carbon because we cause the uh, melting of the Palmer frosts and the melting of the um, Himalayas and the Arctic ice is gone and it's all becoming negative. And that is why um, the disaster could happen much sooner than we think if we go that route, which we won't. Um, uh, maybe because I've put that gloomy thing on the thing, can I, can I also now encourage us to think of hope? Can I share a wonderful um, lesson that I learned from the first chair of the elders? And I now have the responsibility to be chair of the elders following the sad death recently of, of Kofi Annan. I was on a panel in New York a few years ago, it must be about eight years ago, with Archbishop Desmond Tutu in front of a social good conference of young people on their iPads and their phones um, tweeting for social media. So in fact, in these social good conferences, you get a great um, response and you can even trend, is that the word? You, you know, you trend, oh, I'm an elder now, but anyway, get a lot of impact. Get a lot of impact. And when Archbishop Tutu is in front of young people, he is so full of telling them how much he loves them, how great they are, his belief in youth, etc. And he was waving his arms and doing this. And we were being moderated by an American journalist. And she said to Archbishop Tutu very sharply, she said, Archbishop Tutu, why are you such an optimist? And he looked at her and he shook his head and he said, oh no, dear, I'm not an optimist. I'm a prisoner of hope. And that, for me, was a really interesting statement. I mean, it kind of, it, it, it really was a little bit of a light bulb for me, um, because it means, you know, the glass may not be half full, but what you see is there's something in there that you work on, and then you, you know, that, that, that promotes um, energy, that promotes activism, courage, resolution, resilience, etc. cetera. And um, I think we're in a, a phase where we have to be very careful not to speak about climate in such a way that people feel it's hopeless. There are some young people who are coming up to me and saying, I don't know that I want to have any children because I don't want to bring children into a world where it could be unlivable. And you know, that's in its own way a very sad thing to hear a young man or a young woman say to you. But I've had a number saying it to me recently and it disturbs me because we need to be hopeful. Um, when we had the hole in the ozone layer, remember how quickly we responded and we got rid of the refrigerating things that were destroying and very, very quickly we had the Montreal Protocol. And another story, if I may, I don't want to hog the thing, but again, it's on the, on the hopeful side. I often, when I'm talking to students and we're talking about um, the issue of what is possible, um, John F. Kennedy as president announced in 1961 that the United States would put a man on the moon in eight years. It was so ridiculously impossible as an idea, utterly impossible, even though 
the, United, the Soviet Union had a, uh, Yuri Gagarin was, had circled the Earth. Still, it was pretty hope, hopeless. It happened. And the average age in NASA at the time was 26 when it happened, which means the average age when they heard President Kennedy, they were 18. Um, you know, if you work it out for the eight years. Um, it's, uh, I see where we're at now in the world as, as that kind of moonshot time globally. We're in a moonshot time, but the trouble is that we're not imagining how good it will be when we get to a world of completely clean energy, when we get to a world where the one billion people who never switch a switch can have access to lights that will take them out of their deep poverty, the children will have able to do their homework, um, they'd be much healthier. Even um, light in the home, um, uh, electricity is a, is a family planning device um, because people have things to do. And so, you know, you don't have so many, <laughs> it works. Um, and, um, and, 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 and the over 2 billion, 2.6 billion in the world who still cook on dirty cook stoves. We have clean cook stoves, we have the gadgets. Why are we not prioritizing these issues? Why are we not having, as the, um, the 2030 agenda in 2015, with its 17 sustainable development goals, talks about leave no one behind as we move to a sustainable world. You know, this is what um, architects, but in particular, cultural institutions generally have to paint constantly now the pictures of this good world of this healthier world, of this economically more equal world, of this world of new jobs, of exciting entrepreneurial possibilities, and so on. And we need to hear that, and we need the convening of cultural institutions, convening even politicians and that are not seeing... Um, politicians are only seeing the electoral cycle, the, the two, three, five years. And um, business leaders that are not fossil fuel are actually seeing further ahead. Cultural institutions have to be right there seeing far ahead and seeing the real possibilities um, of um, that world that is in our grasp. It's, it's the moonshot world that we have to get to, starting by a huge change over the next 12 years. 12 years. And so it's, you know, um, no time to waste. I think... I was going to say we couldn't end on a better note and we would really like to thank all of the panelists and in a way what Mary has just said is something that we have described in our closing note is that people have said to us well what do you think about the state of architecture and we've talked about optimism that you can't actually operate as an architect unless you're optimistic because you are imagining a future but I think everybody has uh, contributed hugely to this discussion and uh, we thank you so much. It was really rich and really fantastic. Thank you.